Hi, I'm Allie Shansfeld, Managing Editor of Endodontic Practice US, a Medmark publication. Welcome to a live discussion and question and answer with Dr. Brett Gilbert. In our webinar today, we will be exploring the latest innovation in endodontic irrigation using the apical negative pressure technique delivered by the Endovac Pure irrigation device. Before we get started, I would like to invite viewers to use the question box in your control panel to ask any questions. Your questions will be answered at the end of the session. Now I'm pleased to introduce our guest for today, Dr. Brett Gilbert. Dr. Gilbert has a private practice limited to endodontics in Niles, Illinois. He is currently on the faculty in the Department of Endodontics at the University of Illinois at Chicago College of Dentistry and on staff at the Resurrection Medical Center in Chicago. Dr. Gilbert lectures nationally and internationally on clinical endodontics and is a diplomate of the American Board of Endodontics. Dr. Gilbert, we turn the webinar over to you to learn more about the topic for today. Thank you, Mally, and thank you everyone for joining us this evening, really to discuss uh, one of my really truly favorite topics and really a passion of mine in endodontics, which is endodontic irrigation. And there's so much to talk about this evening, but I really want to focus in on some of the real significant points of where we've been, where we'd like to be, and where technology today is really going to carry us. So I, I start you out, and, and a, just a brief introduction for myself, but I start you out with a look at anatomy. Anatomy is such a huge part of this. The pulpal anatomy is complex and convoluted as I'll show you. But again, as Mally mentioned, I do have my own private practice here in Chicago. Uh, really enjoy practicing. Endodontics is great. It's really something I find fun and enjoyable and really rewarding to help patients. And the teaching aspect of what I do is wonderful at the University of Illinois, as well as being able to have the opportunity to speak with you tonight and this type of setting to share with you what's new, what's exciting, try to give you some energy into your endodontics and a better understanding of what we're capable of today. So again, I am actually out of Maryland. I'm born and raised in Baltimore, attended University of Maryland. And one of the most proud moments of my life was the moment I was board certified in endodontics. And this is something that was a, a real goal of mine and, and something I'm proud of and has allowed me to learn and really get even more in depth into my endodontic knowledge and learning. So I want to start you off with something that we all love to look at, which is radiographs. And this is an example of a case that certainly looks fantastic when you, when you see it there. Uh, wonderful fill, really captures the anatomy. But the truth is, is a radiographic result doesn't always mean a wonderful clinical result. And so although we see here wonderful curves and really something that when I look at that makes me very happy to see and, and certainly to be able to share with fellow dentists or referring dentists, but the truth is, is our knowledge of how complex the pulpal anatomy is within these teeth. We really have no confirmation from this radiograph that the tooth is clean. And the reality is, is that, as I'm going to show you in subsequent slides, I want to impress upon you this evening that pulpal anatomy is not what we learn in school. Pulpal anatomy is really complex and convoluted. I'd like to take you on this next slide to really put your eyes on what is an, an old black and white photo, a staining and sectioning of a two-rooted or a two-canaled tooth. And what we see is not just the vertical lines, the, the main canal spaces that we learn about in school, what we try to instrument and capture with our obturation, but we see a lot of other things going on, a lot of connections between the canals, a lot of anastomoses, but most specifically, at the apex, the apical third, the last three millimeters from the very terminus of the root, as you can see in this picture, is highly convoluted, highly complex, and of course extremely difficult to clean. Instruments will not get into these spaces, and so in truth we have to be focused on when we encounter a case and we want to look at it as something straightforward, that we're dealing with very, very complex anatomy. And so I want you to take a mental image of this because the truth is, is this is an old stained photo. Pulpal anatomy hasn't changed. It's amazing to think that through our time with root canal treatment over the, the last six or seven decades that we've been so successful because in truth we recognize that cleaning these areas is a huge challenge. And all the areas listed, ramifications, apical deltas, lateral canals, all these really need to be at the forefront of our minds when we, when we take on endodontic treatment. So again, if we look at anatomy, I hope that as dentists, and if you're not a dentist but just you know, on to enjoy and learn some more, 
I hope that these stained pictures of the dental and pulpal anatomy will really surprise you to some degree because quite honestly every time I look at them I really can't believe how extensive the root canal system is and that's really what we use as the term nowadays we don't think of them as solely root canals but we think of them as root canal systems and this is why a lot of complex connections apical third is extremely difficult and and convoluted complex all the words you can use for extremely kind of closed system that's difficult to access so cleaning this anatomy is really the key to our ultimate increase in success rates and so how can we improve in endodontics we can improve on ways to get into these spaces and clean better again I'd like to really take you to this this is a great picture and this kind of takes us to the point of we learn in school about instrumentation instrumentation with instruments is critical obviously and what this photo shows is that the red marks on this tooth canal what that shows is where the instruments actually touch the canal space after rotary instrumentation was completed. So take it as this. The green is all of what's left behind. Bacteria, tissue, really irritants to the body. Biofilm, as we'll discuss. So when we look at, and I like to call it pulpal real estate, the reality is, is that our instruments only touch 35% that and that's a study from Ove Peters that really highlighted the extensive nature of the canal systems and how our instruments simply don't even touch them so how do we get to this green space that you see here on this photo and the answer is, is we have to use our irrigation and so we're here tonight to talk about irrigation because as you can see the instruments just don't get us where we need to be so when we look at this here I want to take you again to an example of a root system and what it really truly looks like and I think that some of these pictures that you see and I've given credit here of course to Root Canal Anatomy Project um, it's a wonderful site they're very generous with their photos very generous with their depictions of canal systems and I just want to recognize that these systems are extremely impressive when you think about how they're put together but extremely challenging to clean and so again I want to lead off with the idea that anatomy has to be at the forefront of our mind and that's why we want to bring new technology to the table to increase our ability to irrigate so here's a great example of if we took a radiograph of this we would probably see a pretty decent result we'd see a nice fill we'd see that the lengths of course this root's been sectioned but are right to the end of the root what we wouldn't see is all the bacteria. You can see the intracanal bacteria as brown sludge, essentially probably in the form of biofilm around the gutta percha. And then also the isthmus, and that's the word that we use to, to talk about the connection, especially at the apical third of a root, where you can see that there's a huge connection there that's probably all full of bacteria. And so we need to be focused on this type of issue when we take on endodontic treatment and I'm hoping that all of this the anatomy the idea of the extensive nature of the bacteria would motivate you to say to yourself you know what I really need to up my game when it comes to irrigation and we're going to show you just how to do that so we like to think of bacteria again going back to our school days and of course there's probably a huge range of our audience of when you were in school but in general we like to think of bacteria in the canal as being planktonic right so I take example of these these nice vacationers floating on their float in the lazy river and the reality is is that planktonic bacteria are just free floating in space and if all we had to do was capture and kind of remove these bacteria I don't think we have quite the challenge that we would expect but the real significant bacteria that we have to deal with is biofilm biofilm now is the next highlight I want to bring to the table tonight so in, in essence we have a complex multi-species community a conglomeration of bacteria that so, their sole function is to protect one another a good analogy and I heard uh, someone give this it was Dr. Buchanan who I heard uh, lecture recently and he said think of it like a jungle you have all different plants involved you have the trees that go up and catch the sun you have the ones that cover the ground and so the biofilm is really that type of structure and they're all designed to really protect one another so as I run this video you'll see if we could just send a little wave of irrigation down to the end of the root and remove those floating people the planktonic bacteria great it would really be quite a pleasure but the truth is is our challenge is actually taking away the brown sludge that you see on the walls and those are the types of pictures that I need in your mind so we have complex bacteria coated with this biofilm like you see here on the walls of this lazy river and so it just represents the type of challenge we have and and something we want to impart on on you tonight so when we talk about biofilm 
there has been over history some misconception, I believe, about what biofilm looks like within the root canal system. So as I learned in school, it was really more of an extra radicular problem. So you could have a, um, a biofilm form on the apex of the tooth, somewhat of a rationale for apical surgery to remove that. But some of the newer texts, and this is one by, by Dr. Sedgley Akishin, really an up-to-date look at biofilm and what they found as you see in quotes is that biofilms can be found virtually in all areas of the root canal system including the main canal the apical and lateral ramifications isthmuses and recesses so biofilm is a major problem intracanal and it really is everywhere so we need to be focused on the idea of difficult anatomy extensive bacteria in the form of biofilm what can we do better to, to really eliminate this material? So again, intracanal bacteria, another study I'd like to share with you here. And what they found is this study looked at canal systems after instrumentation. So one visit ended on a treatment and found that you had microbes in the form of biofilm everywhere, main canal, isthmuses, lateral canals, accessory canals, and that the bacteria as they sat within those systems were in the form of biofilm. So a complex, multi-species community, one that is really designed to evade removal and detection. So uh, biofilm is a major issue. So I want you to focus this evening on anatomy, and I want you to focus on the form of bacteria within that anatomy in the, in the form of biofilm. So chemical debridement becomes the key. We learn in school about mechanical debridement instruments, as we'll discuss, and chemical debridement. So what I like to consider instrumentation as at this point is it's our main way to create a pathway a pathway from coronal to apex in which we can actually flow the irrigant down into the canal. So the delivery of our irrigants are critical. The irrigants that we use are the same as we've always used. We really still rely on sodium hypochlorite and we rely on EDTA. And so the idea is that what we are hoping to find is greater success if we can deliver these solutions, the same solutions we've always used and the same solutions you're probably using in your practice today but be able to deliver them in a better, more effective way, an innovative way that allows us to be safer and allows us to do the job better. So I truly think that as good as our success rates are in endo, probably in the range of the 90%, that we can go higher. We can reach another peak. And so I do, I do believe that improved methods and innovative technology and irrigation is the key. And the chemical debridement is really everything. So where are we? I, I show you this picture and of course, in my opinion, this is the worst thing that can happen in your endo practice or in your general practice, and that is that you have a situation where sodium hypochlorite gets past the end of the route. So we have been in history ultra conservative in a way of trying to minimize the risk of having an accident, and by doing that, we've been taking away the clinical efficacy of our treatment. So we need a greater volume of solution to actually reach that apical third, but we want to do it in a way that's safe so we don't wind up having a problem like this, which is really a devastating situation, certainly for the patient, most importantly, but also for the doctor to manage. So what we want to do is we want to find a way where we can increase our volume, increase the depth of, of our irrigation while minimizing risk. And that's really what we're here to discuss tonight. Our goal has always been to use more solutions safer. And so that's where innovation in irrigation comes in. So when you look at what the R&D departments within all the endodontic companies are looking at today, it's irrigation. This is the hot button to topic. This is what I like to call a trending topic. Um, and really, everyone is focused on getting more, a higher volume of irrigant delivered deep, deep into the canal of the apical third and doing it in a way that minimizes our risk and is safe. And so that's really why I say hashtag irrigation because this is hot, this is now, and this is where, again, everyone is looking at the opportunity for us to get better. So what are our goals in order to attain better success rates? So we want to have better Im improved debridement of the isthmuses within the canals. Uh, we certainly want to have better biofilm disruption and then once disrupted, really removal. Certainly, we want to be able to stimulate and, and be able to, to get the instruments to be able to deliver it in a way that's much safer and better. And ultimately, we can accomplish these goals of better debridement by really increasing our technology and being able to really address the anatomy that really before now we have been unable to do. So two tiers of cleansing that we learn in school, as I mentioned. You have the mechanical debridement, burrs, files, ultrasonic tips. And then the chemical debridement, the irrigation, irrigation solution. So let's look at each of these. Again, 
you have wonderful technology and instrumentation at this point. And all of what you see on the screen is a representation of that, including, you know, NITI rotary instruments. But again, the rotary instruments only get you about 35% of the job done. So I like to consider that, of course, we're going to use the best instruments available to us, but that the goal with the instruments is to clear a pathway for effective irrigation to reach the entire root canal system. So making a path from, from coronal to apex to flow our irrigant. So the chemical cleansing by irrigation has classically been done by the needle irrigation technique. Everything that we've learned in school has really kind of led us to this needle irrigation. And so this poses some risks, again, as I mentioned mentioned with the accident type of situation, but also there's a lot of issues going on with being able to deliver the solution by being able to drip it into the chamber, okay? So there are some barriers that have been there in our irrigation efforts, and it's the technology that we hope will really overcome that. So, um, you know, being able to deliver solution physically to the apex of the root has been difficult, um, and part of that has to do with with bubbling and the idea of, of air that gets trapped in the canals. So the literature has shown that there have been some barriers for some time. We've recognized that. Um, but also the literature had some really strong ideas on how to overcome this. And an and article by Chow um, really was one of these. And again, this is back from 1983 but showing that um, in order to be effective to, to irrigate, you needed to think of it mechanically and you needed to be, be able to create some type of current force to really pull the irrigant down. You needed to be able to reach the end of the root, which is a challenge as I'll discuss in and of itself, and then be able to carry particles away. So this, this was quoted as the Chow paradigm. And I think some of the newer technology relies on this kind of concept in order to be able to um, overcome the barriers. So again, Part of this, um, it, the result of, of this study by Chow was to show that there is an issue with bubbling and that if air bubbles get into the canal, which as I'll discuss is a natural thing to happen when sodium hypochlorite reaches organic tissue, that it is very difficult for further solutions to get past that bubbling. And so I'm going to show you in a couple different ways that this is what it looks like within the canal when you have sodium hypochlorite dissolving tissue. And that's probably the number one best uh, property of sodium hypochlorite, is that it allows us to dissolve tissue while being highly antibacterial. But look at what it does, it creates bubbles. And bubbles in and of themselves pose a significant challenge to increasing and furthering our irrigation. So the apical vapor lock, the apical vapor lock is something you may have heard about or read about, but these bubbles that form from the contact of sodium hypochlorite in the canal against tissue, they collect in the apical third, and they become a barrier to allowing the, the solutions to reach the apical third. So a couple of videos here I hope you'll be able to see as I transition into them. But this is an example of a file passing through a, a, min, um, a mimicked canal, and as you see, when that file reaches the apical third of the canal, it's in air. There is no solution being carried to the apex as we'd like to think. This would be an example of putting a gutter percha point or some other point down into the canal. As you see, the air displaces the solution. So whereas we feel lucky that we've gotten the solution as close to the apex as we have here, we're totally blocked out of vapor lock preventing us from really truly cleaning this area. So a significant concern that we need to overcome, and that's what we're going to discuss this evening. So positive pressure, standard protocol, solution is placed into the pulp chamber, it flows down into the canal, and it really is flowing from coronal to apical, as you see in the picture. I look at this as the old game, and, and I'll show you why. So here we are, we've got the group of positive pressure irrigants. These are all needle irrigators, and they're getting ready to go out on the field, and they're excited, and they're going to go get those bacteria. We're going to beat them fair and square, and they're ready to go. And then they march out on the field, and they're ready, except, whoa, wait a minute. This might be the new form of irrigation. And these guys look a lot more sophisticated and a lot stronger. So in my mind, the old game of positive pressure irrigation just can't compete. And that's why we want to talk to you about what we call apical negative pressure. And that's how I introduced the endovac. So the endovac is the new game. And the idea here is that you have three components to this. And of course, the Endovac Pure, which is the newer device, as I'm going to 
definitely get into and introduce here shortly, really needs to be explained if we take a look at the older device to understand the concept. So in number one, you're delivering solution into the pulp chamber just as you always have. And that's going to be just positive pressure, just flow from inside into the pulp chamber. As you see in picture number two, we introduce what's called a macro cannula. So this cannula reaches, as you see, about a middle two-thirds down the canal. And as you can envision, this is a high-speed suction tip, this macro cannula. And so what it does is it pulls the solution down right to where the suction is at the end and then evacuates it. So it's actually pulling and evacuating in consistent cycles. So what that does is it introduces fresh sodium hypochlorite, which is going to be more powerful and have better dissolving capabilities, and it's constantly refreshing it. It's also giving you this opportunity, as Chow described, to carry particles away. So you introduce the solution into the chamber, and the macro cannula carries it away in the top two-thirds of the canal. But the real magic is number three, and that's called the micro cannula. So this is actually a cannula, that, a suction tip, that you would take two working lengths to full working length. And by doing this, you eliminate the apical vapor lock. So in this situation, it will pull solution down all the way to working length and out and constantly flowing and refreshing. So this is the new game. This is endovac. This is apical negative pressure irrigation. Again, three components to it, the delivery tip, the macro cannula, the micro cannula. Again, they work in conjunction. As you see on the inset of picture number three, you can see the little apertures at the end of the cannula. And this is actually allowing you to have high speed suction at working length, giving you a constant fresh uh, sodium hypochlorite as well as carrying particles away. So what this does is it gives you the current force Chow talked about. It gives you the ability to reach all the way to the apex, as Chow talked about, as well as carry the particles away. So this is the apical negative pressure. Again, three parts to it. You have the master delivery tip. You have the macro. Again, this would go to about two-thirds to uh, about the middle of the canal space. And then the micro cannula, which can actually go two working lengths. So pretty phenomenal and, um, and really interesting to, to be able to introduce to you if you're not familiar. So another depiction just to show you of apical negative pressure irrigation, the solution is basically flowed into the chamber, it's pulled all the way down to the end of the cannula and then carried out. And this is done in constant fresh exchange over and over again, giving you an opportunity to carry particles away. But we understand that sodium hypochlorite actually is deactivated much faster than we thought in the canal. So the days of leaving a little solution in there and walking away aren't getting you as far as you would hope because it does neutralize quickly. So this is the fresh exchange, always having the most powerful irrigant at the apex, getting to those apical and anatomical areas, breaking up and carrying away the biofilm as we described. So how much irrigant can a canal hold? So this was a study by Fanabunda in 1986. He made some calculations regarding the average sizes of canals. And when they took that into play with the endovac, they found that apical negative pressure allowed you to actually cycle through and replace the fresh sodium hypochlorite 188 times in 30 seconds. So this is a tremendous flow of irrigant to the apical end of the root, allowing you to not only, again, kill bacteria, break up biofilm, but also carry those particles away, really giving you a cleaner canal and, and really what I, would, what I would tell you is better results. So the endovac, as many of you I'm sure or hope you have heard of, is now transitioning into endovac pure, and that's why we're here this evening. So this is a new innovation that has been developed, and everything I've just described for endovac is all built into the endovac pure. So that's why I wanted to teach you the technique and have you understand it on those terms so that we can now look at something really exciting, really innovative, really kind of designed for ease of use. Um, as you can see, it's a small unit that can be mounted on your, on your operatory's pole. It can be placed on the countertop. Everything that I was describing is built into that little head that you see there. Um, and I'm going to go through each, each, each part of the machine, of course. But it has reservoirs, of, as you see, that hold both EDTA and sodium hypochlorite and um, allows you to do this apical negative pressure with single-handed operation. So how does the endovac pure work? So the way it works is that the irrigant, irrigant, again, is delivered right into the access chamber through a delivery tip. Okay, the irrigant then flows rapidly and forcefully, so this is the, the current force that Chow talked about, and is pulled down to the end of the root, which is the negative pressure we talk about. So it's a pulling of the solution versus with, with positive pressure trying to push it.
So the irrigant flows down to the end of the root. It is then captured within the apertures of the cannula and then is able to be carried away along with debris up through the evacuation. So irrigant is flowed in, it's carried and pulled down to the end of the cannula, and then it's carried away by, by the suctioning. So this is really how the pure works. Again, it's the same apical negative pressure technique we discussed. So a couple different parts to the unit. This is going to be what they call the apex cartridge. So this is going to be a disposable treatment cartridge that attaches to the handpiece. It has a, an irrigation hood that actually covers over the access. So this is kind of creating a closed system, which is very interesting has a delivery tip which will dispense the solution by the touch of a button. It has the two cannulas, the macro, which will take you about a half to two thirds as you see depicted here. And then a micro pure which actually takes you to full working length. So imagine being able to safely irrigate at full working length and what that would mean to your necrotic case, what that would mean to your retreatment case. Really better irrigation. So again, with the macro pure cannula in place, we're going to have solution delivered into the chamber. It's going to be then carried down to the end of the cannula because again it's being pulled by the high speed evacuation of that macro cannula. So once it reaches the opening it's carried away very quickly and forcefully and so this is really how we're able to remove bigger pieces of debris, bacteria, etc. through this macro pure which has a little bit larger opening at the end. Okay so we then transition into the micro pure. So again, this is extended through the macro, as you see, and actually goes to full working length. This allows you to fully pull and have negative pressure to working length and allows you to then carry it away again through the high speed evacuation. So this is very innovative in a sense where you're overcoming the AB uh, allowing yourself to not be so ultra conservative and doing a, not as good of a clinical job in order to protect you and patient. And so this is very innovative in the way that this has been designed and this again is something that I think is, is going to be something that anyone could use and feel good about how to use it and again expect better clinical results. So again it's carried down and then carried away. So this is actually what the unit looks like in, in clinical use. Um, everything you see flowing through the little plastic tubing there is actually what's being carried away. So what I like about the endovac is when you're using it, you see that solution flowing away and you say to yourself, that's been to apex, that's been to working length, that's carrying away all that biofilm and all the bacteria that I don't want, all the tissue. So it's very interesting, obviously single-handed operation, and this is apical negative pressure irrigation, um, and this is the endovac pure. So studies, evidence, let's get some evidence. Nielsen and Baumgartner did a study. Uh, again, this is kind of a seminal article for, for the apical negative pressure. We needed to establish that endovac or apical negative pressure, how does it stand up to the needle irrigation? And the reality is, is that they tested cleanliness at one and three millimeters from the apex and really didn't see a tremendous difference up to three millimeters. So that means that classically, we've done a pretty good job of cleaning the top two thirds of the canal. Of course, we recognize that the apical third, the last third, is the most critical, the most difficult to clean, and the most important. And what they found with endovac is it was significantly cleaner at one millimeter from the apex. So that's a very significant finding. This was a study by Desai and Van Himmel, which showed essentially everyone wants to know, well, is it going to go past the apex? If I'm pulling it down to the apex, do I have a risk of going past? And this study showed that apical negative pressure did not extrude irrigant after deep intracanal delivery and suctioning of the irrigant to the full working length of the canal. So this study stands to show that this technique does not allow extrusion of the solution. And I'd like to give an example of this. So if you consider the fact that the whole reason and the only reason due to everything we've discussed tonight that solution would even be at the apex is because of this high speed current force, this pulling of the solution to the apex. So let's say the cannula were to get clogged for instance. Well at that point there would be no suction to pull the solution down. There would be no solution apically. So this is really the idea of why this is something you can use predictably because once it reaches those suction openings, it flows right in and it's unable to then go anywhere past there. Um, and then clinically as far as results, so what this study by Gandhi et al. looked at was 
what are the, the clinical implications? And what they found was, I think, very important, that a cleaner canal equals less post-op pain. I think that's pretty logical. And so with this, they found that really up to full working length that this was safe to use to irrigate your apical third. So we've overcome our apical vapor lock. We've overcome the inability of instruments to really truly clean apically. And now we have our chemical debridement happening right at the apex. So very exciting. So in summary, I want to impart upon you that pulpal canal anatomy is highly complex, highly convoluted, difficult, challenging, really something that we have to really take on as a significant competitor. Um, irrigation in the apical third really to me is the key to our increases in endodontic success. We have been very fortunate. A testament to the human body's healing capability that we have had the type of results over time that we have had because truthfully we haven't done a very good job in the most important part of the canal. Um, again, increases in endodontic irrigation technology using the same solutions but delivering them in a much more effective way is really going to be the key to our increased clinical outcomes. The Endovac is an, is, gives us an opportunity to have an effective innovative tool in our office, something we can all use that combines safety and clinical efficacy. The Endovac, what I would describe it is as innovative irrigation. You have a high volume, again we've, some of the studies show that it's not as much the concentration of the solution you're using, but the volume. So we have a high volume of irrigant delivery to full working length. As, as we saw from Fanabunda's study, continuous fresh exchange in the terms of 188 cycles of fresh solution reaching the end of the canal every 30 seconds. Safe and effective, better results. I really thank you for joining us this evening. I'd like to thank the end of practice uh, staff and and, and everyone that worked toward this webinar, really professional. Thank you to Kerr Endodontics for allowing me to be a part of this and, and be a part of such. Uh Uh, of innovation that's so exciting and I really hope that uh, you've enjoyed the webinar this evening. We do have a Q&A session coming and, and again thank you all for joining and, and for those of you that helped put it together, thank you for your efforts. Thank you Dr. Gilbert. We have some questions from the audience um, but before I get to those questions I would like again to invite viewers to use the question box in your control panel to ask any questions that you have. Um, our first question um, is what is the minimum taper of instrumentation so that the irrigation is effective? That's a great question. Uh, the reality is, is that the micro cannula, as I described, the one that fits to working length, the diameter of it is 0.32 millimeters. So what that would mean is that if you were able to prepare your canal to a 35, then that would fit just perfectly and allow you to get full canal irrigation. However, as we all know, and in an age of being more conservative or in the age of having very difficult and curved canals, the reality is, is if you were unable to prepare to a 35, let's say you prepared to a 30, you would still get this amazing irrigation just one millimeter off of, of your working length. So the truth is, is that the ideal preparation would be a 35, but if you weren't able to get to that point, you still would get a profound effect even if you had a smaller preparation. Okay, um, next question. Do you use chlorhexidine? Why or why not? Chlorhexidine is another solution that certainly is strong in the endo literature. Really chlorhexidine has its place and, and really it pertains more to retreatment cases. And the reason is is that we found that in the types of bacteria that you find in a previously treated tooth, for instance, E. fecalis is just an example. And it's the example most cited in the literature, but I will say that it's not necessarily confirmed that that's the the pathogen that is actually our problem, but one that's like it, a very resistant type of anaerobic organism. There have been some studies that have shown uh, an effectiveness of chlorhexidine against that. So in an instance of where you were working with chlorhexidine, in my opinion, it would be more in your retreatment cases versus your everyday root canal infection or initial treatment cases. Okay, uh, next question. What is more important, apical diameter or taper? Uh, well, at this point, really apical diameter, um, apical enlargement is something that allows us, again, to remove more of the biofilm and bacteria apically, but I think we all recognize at this point that we want to be more conservative with dentin, we want to be more minimally tapered, and so I think that the trending uh, 
way that instrumentation is going is that we're all about conserving dentin. And so a larger taper is going to remove more dentin. And in the earlier days of instrumentation, that was actually necessary to get to the apex. But in today's world of instruments, everything is flexible and strong. And really, you have the ability to have a smaller taper, but have still a significant apical enlargement that allows you to really have this effective irrigation and debris removal. Okay, I have a question from Dr. Rossler, who wants you to know his name. Uh, macro and micro cannulas are, are one now in the endovac pure. How do you prevent the micro not to clog? That's a great question. There are different experiences that some users might have. I personally have no issue with clogging. The idea is that if you have an opportunity to use the macro appropriately, you really do remove the debris that is really of significant size. So by the time you get to the micro, typically clogging really is not much of an issue. I personally also like to do a little bit of ultrasonic uh, agitation first as well. And sometimes that may be an opportunity to loosen or remove more of the debris with the macro cannula. But the reality is, is that uh, the clogging really does not seem to be an issue with the unit. What is the risk that the endovac needle will go past the apex? So that's a very interesting question, and I think it's one that needs to be asked and answered. So because what we're depending upon is negative pressure, the canal system itself actually has kind of a negative pressure gradient against the, the actual periapical tissue. So for instance, if I'm using the endovac and it, the, macro, the micro cannula sorry, is out of the apex, the interesting thing is, is that you won't really be getting any type of solution that will be pulled down the canal. So so you need that closed system to have the negative pressure. So for instance, if I push the, the macro cannula out of the end of the, the apex, you won't see really any action occurring through the cannula at all because it doesn't have that negative pressure gradient to work with. So you would just basically be doing positive pressure irrigation at that point. So that's, okay. that's the inherent safety of it. Okay, a little cryptic question. Number four, PUI, endovac, or both? Yeah, so I'm, I'm on team both, uh, and I'm actually right now working with some residents at the University of Illinois on a study, which I'd like to hopefully show that as being the best protocol to use. So for me, the uh, ultrasonic, you know, ir irrigation of solution is a simple, you know, really cost-effective and easy way to start my final irrigation protocol, and that irrigation protocol always ends with endovac. And so I think personally both, but if you talk to some other doctors that use it, they may say that they only go with the endovac. But I think that if you're using ultrasonic activation, continue to do that and just do a really great job at the end with the endovac. Okay. Wow, questions are coming uh, very quickly. How long should we keep endovac in for some efficient exchange of irrigants, seconds, minutes, alternating irrigants, your protocol basically. Yeah, so there is an alteration, and, and I'm sorry, uh, there is a irrigant protocol and you do alternate from sodium hypochlorite to EDTA and there's typically about a 30 second interval that will occur a little less with the EDTA. You're using a much smaller volume of EDTA than sodium hypochlorite, but as you'll see if you do, you know, log on to the website and get a little more information, request maybe to have a rep come out to your office, but there is a definitive protocol that alternates sodium hypochlorite, EDTA, sodium hypochlorite, and you're also alternating from the macro to the micro cannula, ultimately finishing with the macro kind of start as the starting point and finishing with the micro cannula with sodium hypochlorite, but typically it's about a 30 second interval for sodium hypochlorite. Okay. Um, according to you, what should be the maximum apical diameter of the canal after finishing the canal with the finishing file? The maximum, I think, I think most canals will dictate how they should be prepared personally. I think that there are canals that are quite long and skinny and tight and some that are very large. And that might mean in a large canal that maybe the rotary instruments aren't big enough and you need to use some type of hand instrument, for instance, to be able to fully debride the walls. And an example of that might be tooth number eight or tooth number 20 that's really wide open. And in contrast, 
the, t the typical file systems today should allow you to open to a 35 and allow you to be able to get that really minimum diameter that you need to get the best possible apical irrigation with apical negative pressure. So, you know, sometimes certain canals may not facilitate that or sometimes it takes a lot of courage to get yourself there. Um, so if you need a more minimal prep for any of those reasons, again, apical negative pressure still really helps you. Even if you're, you know, at a size, you know, 25, you're still going to get excellent irrigation. But ideally, I think you want to be focused on trying to at least get to a 35 apical apical prep. Uh, next, the can is the cannula, cannula flexible or not to reach deeper in non-straight root canals? Yeah, it, it actually is surprisingly flexible, and um, and so you know you can actually put like a little curve on it, just like you would on a on a hand file, for instance, to facilitate having it reach. But in general, it does really really able to kind of traverse and get back to the apical working length. So that's something that you know maybe thinking of it outside of the box, not using it. I I think that's a great question, but the answer is from a user standpoint, it really it really does work that way. Can we use heated sodium hypo hypochloride with endovac? Uh, no. So the 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 unit is interesting where it actually has a reservoir for each solution, sodium hypochlorite and EDTA. And so basically once you put it in there, it is it is as the manufacturer intends it to be. And so there's no real way that you could heat it. And so, you know, again, heating hypochlorite in and of itself. There are some different thoughts on that, and, and some say that it increases effectiveness. Others say it actually enhances its its decrease effectiveness because of the way heat works with bleach. Bleach is a really interesting chemical. We're learning more and more about it, but the answer is that no, it will be dispensed from the endovac at the temperature at which the unit uh, dictates, which is typically room temperature. Okay. Are the cartridges pre-sterilized? That's a good question. Yes, they come in little blister packs, and so they are pre-sterilized and really ready to go at the chair side. So another nice, nice component of it that they are pre-sterilized. Obviously, something that you're going to be used submerged, you know, submerged in sodium hypochlorite probably will become sterilized very quickly if it wasn't preoperatively. But again, they do come in sterilized blister packs. Did you mention what con what concentration of sodium hypochlorite do you use? You yeah, it's up to six percent. So okay. you know, depending on what you what you use, most of the literature will cite five point two five as kind of the standard, but up to six percent. And what brand of EDTA do you use? I I, I prefer the Smear Clear. Uh, that's something that we use that has you know somewhat of a surfactant in it called cetramide uh, but that's a, a Kerr product that I like which is called smear clear but if you do use EDTA there, you are supposed to use a 17% solution I'm not really even certain that it's marketed in any other concentration but uh, EDTA that I use is smear clear okay. do you prefer single visit or two visit endodontics ah the million dollar question. The truth is, is I, I look at it from a case by case basis. I think that if there's an opportunity to do single visit, the patient's comfortable, they're able to tolerate your treatment for maybe an extended period of time, fantastic, single visit. But I really look at it, at it as a case by case basis because you may have a case where it's very difficult to really get good instrumentation or to reach the apex or you may have a difficult time finding MB2. So I would much prefer to not pigeonhole myself with the patient at the outset of treatment. So I'll typically tell patients it will be either one or two visits and I truthfully won't know until I get in there and get the procedure started because the one thing I don't want is to promise a patient one visit and have to then turn around and explain why I wasn't able to deliver on that. And sometimes I don't want to feel rushed or pressured. So I encourage dentists to look at it case by case. But certainly one visit endo is appropriate and typically can be used in, in almost in really most situations. I have time for one more question and that is, is there a recommended file system to be used with the endovac pure? Uh, well, I personally, for what I just described, again, minimizing your taper, minimizing the removal of dentin, but also being able to apically enlarge effectively, that's why I like the TF and the TF adaptive system. So to me, it, it combines the best of both worlds. You have the ability to really have a minimal, minimal taper, as you saw on that really nice curvy case that I shared in the beginning of the webinar but also be able to preserve dentin and get your good apical prep. So I personally am partial to the, the TF, the twisted file, 
or TF adaptive, which is used in, a, in an adaptive motion. Okay, I said that was the last question, but there is one more question okay. coming up. Be clear, uh, I'll be a little clear on the concept of apical vapor lock. Why does it form? Uh, so it's just the mechanics of the canal space and the idea that when you have all of this bubbling happening from the action of the sodium hypochlorite on the tissue, it just tends to collect at the apical end of the root and that becomes a barrier. And so the apical vapor lock is something we've been aware of for some time, but quite honestly had no ability to, to combat it or to overcome it. The apical negative pressure allows you to do that because you really have that suctioning force which removes the air and allows you to pull and deliver the sodium hypochlorite or EDTA to the apex. All right. Uh, that, thank you so much for this really interesting presentation. I would like to thank all our, our viewers uh, for your questions, but we've run out of time today. And so if we did not get to your question, we will answer them after the webinar via email. Following the webinar, we will send you a recording of this presentation, and feel free to visit www.curdental.com if you'd like to learn more about the Endovac and additional products from Kerr Endodontics. Thank you again, Dr. Gilbert, for your wonderful presentation, and thank you all for attending. Until next time.